Welcome back to Quest and Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at this really interesting book, uh, Knock Issue Number One. Uh, so that implies it's going to be a continuing series. What it does is, well, it takes a lot of the best writing and blog posts from the old school D&D blogosphere, and it puts it together into a beautifully designed, illustrated, and formatted book to make it much more accessible for people who aren't able to tap into all the wealth of information that you find on all of these blogs scattered all over the place. Uh, here is our back cover right here. And before we get started, quick shout out to some of my uh, new patrons over on Patreon, including Giles Sherwood, William Hilton, Adam Stewart, Tsubami, uh, Davi Holanda, and Roni Bob. Thank you so much for your support. Now, before we get into it, let's look at uh, the inside cover here because, oh well, it comes with a little um, card here, which is very cool. Original art by Russ Nicholson, who did a lot of art in some of the uh, early role-playing games, I think including D&D, but also uh, games like Warhammer, I believe, with a spell book that randomly gives you new spells every time you open it. So that's pretty neat. Put that over there. What we find is if we take off the cover, we see kind of an alternate cover here where we can see the title, the number, and the subtitle, An Adventure Gaming Bric-a-Brac, which is a pretty good summary. And on the inside of this cover, we find a full-on dungeon crawl. So we have room descriptions here, along with options that you can check off to, uh, so you can customize this dungeon to your own preferences. We have the reaction tables, the 2d6, right there in the middle of the spine. And we have the actual dungeon map right there. So that's really cool. Every single inch of this book is being used for something, which I really appreciate. Let's get into the book a bit more here. Oh, there's more, even more information on the back cover once you take that off. You have the same monster again, but with this you can roll 1d4, uh, 1d4 d20s and consult the spine. So you can look on the spine here and there's even more information there. Um, what does it say here? Drop all of the demons hit dice on this cover. Use as many results as you like. So you drop the hit dice on here, depending on where they fall. You look at the number that's rolled and that tells you even more about it. So it's a die drop table. It's a lot of fun. There's a great sense of whimsy to all the design here. Uh, in, in the interest of full disclosure, I do have one or two or three, I think three uh, blog posts from my blog that ended up inside uh, this edition. So take that into consideration. I'm not going to be reviewing my own blog posts, but I will point them out when I come to them. Um, forwards, basically telling you what you're in for here. This is a summary of some of the best OSR thinking out there. And so we have some of our contributions over here. The, a lot of these uh, names might look very familiar to you, including people like Emmy Allen and Paolo Greco, uh, Gabor Lux, who did uh, Castles in Tillin, which I just reviewed. Bryce Lynch is one of the best um, old school adventure reviewers out there. Um, some other ones here, Sean McCoy, Fiona Geist, Chris McDowell, who did Into the Odd, Gavin Norman did Old School Essentials. Uh, Jason Schultes uh, did Roll D1D12. So he did, um, I forget the name of what it's called on the actual blog, but it's just a collection of really great D12 tables. Skull Fungus does a lot of great maps. Uh, Chris Tam does tons of D100 tables that are really fun. Daniel Sell did Troika. So just lots of people that you've probably seen before on this channel. And we have our actual content over here. Uh, just so everyone knows, I believe that they are actually accepting uh, submissions for their second issue. I'll put a link down in the description below in case you want to submit something. Uh, we start off right away with what I want in an OSR game, which is really great because uh, this blog post, which is by Brooks Daily, um, allows you to really get a good handle on what the old school scene is, what sets it apart from 5th edition. Encounter-based high adventure, oracular dice and impartial adjudicator, player skill and fictional engagement, adventure as expedition, and a comparison of old and new D&D. This one by Gavin Norman. So what I love about this is that when you tell people about the OSR and you tell them that there's a lot, a lot of the books are great, but a lot of the best thinking, and the most interesting things are on the internet, on these blogs, it's really hard to actually summarize that for people. You have to try and find these lists of bests of on people's blogs and things like that. But this takes a lot of the best thinking and just makes it look beautiful. Look at this art. 
I don't even know where all this art came from. Almost every two page spread has art on it. Some of it is, uh, what do you call it? Public domain. And a lot of it clearly has been commissioned. So a ton of work went into this. The layout is very lush and elaborate. It reminds me a little bit of Morkborg in that sense. Um, although I do think it is easier to read generally than Morkborg. <clears throat> a great D66 table of wizard weaknesses. So for example, the wizard has replaced all his blood with liquid magic. He needs to put it back inside once in a while and without it, it will be terribly, and without it will be terribly weakened. Morkborg, however, is a, um, it's an actual game, right? There's a reference material. And so having stuff kind of in different formats on each page makes it a little bit harder to reference. Whereas this, every single article that's been included here is really its own thing. So having a unique layout for each article, I think works quite well, uh, especially it makes it feel more like a magazine. The feel of the pages is really great. Everything's very glossy and magazine like. The, it feels quite sturdy. It's, I mean, it's, it's glue-bound because it's a, it's a paperback. Um, but it feels really good in the hand. It has a nice heft to it because of this high-quality paper. Dungeon Checklist by Arnold Kemp, uh, which is who does uh, Goblin Punch, one of my favorites. What you need to put in a dungeon. Oh, this is one of my articles, What Kids RPGs Are Missing. Stuff from Wandering Monsters. That's a great random table. Again, this one's a little hard to read. Hit dice are meant to be rolled. And I could just go on and on through this. I'm gonna just keep flipping through it for a little while so you can get a sense of the types of articles or blog posts that are in here. That's another one of mine. There's Chris McDowell, exposing your prep. Rulings not rules is insufficient. This one by Arnold Kemp was a huge step forward in my thinking in terms of what the old school play style is and what it is that you should be designing when you are making old school adventures. How to create the kinds of problems that force players to actually involve themselves with the environment rather than uh, just looking at their character sheet and trying to find abilities that will get them through stuff. Uh, there's another one of my articles, The Labors of Hercules as an OSR obstacle. Uh, it strikes me that a lot of old uh, fairy tales and myths have this kind of OSR style where you have a hero that's often out of their depth. They're put into a weird situation with no obvious solutions, and then they get out uh, through cunning, through looking at the situation and finding a new way to look at it and to approach it. And that's what makes the stories fun and memorable. Uh, RPGs as Emotional Gambling, that's by Emmy Allen, a.k.a. Cave Girl. Another one by Emmy Allen. The Danger of Skills. A little system for thieving to handle rogue skill training so that each rogue can customize their abilities. Rules for Dueling by Emmy Allen. Eight Statue Encounters. Overly Thematic Dungeon, this by Gabor Lux, who did Castles in Tillin. I haven't actually read too much of his blog, so it's really great to see some of these um, picks from things that I didn't read when they were all nine, so I can catch up on them. So here's uh, something from one of Jason Schultz's D12 tables. So, and they're all very gonzo and very flavorful, so let's pick one at random here. Living Vapor, coalesced just after the origin of the universe, currently incarcerated by Wizard. 99% of knowing the answer to any given question wants its freedom. Or Ogre, that always wanted to be smart, found a ring with three wishes, two remaining. Bryce Lynch, ways to improve your treasure. How to deal with traps. Some of these are just like a single sentence or a single paragraph. Oh, wait, this one's a bit longer than that. Some of the ones near the end were like that that I saw. The pathetic aesthetic, which is, you know, the typical old school aesthetic of crumbling ruins and sad sack adventures. 
Although these days people tend to put a lot uh, of different themes on top of that old school skeleton. Thirty-four good traps. This is another great example of how to create situations that players have to engage with. When I made my video on making good traps, this was a big inspiration for that. You don't need a lot of stuff for traps, but it should be something that is easily understandable and that players can bypass through uh, cleverness. Chris Tam. So here's a classic Chris Tam table. Three hundred useless magic loot. So it could be something like the gilded bird cage of capture. Leave the door open, and birds are attracted and trapped. Right? Simple. Um, but it says useless, but it's not really useless. If you're smart, that could be really useful in the right situation. And it's just packed with these things. The goblin tankard, the codpiece of the titans, uh, the blanket of picnicking, hobo boots. I love the artwork. It's eclectic, um, but it really captures the variety of uh, styles and aesthetics that you do find in the old school. I eat the body. The I search the body random table is a staple of fantasy games, but a weird fantasy game needs something more, something else. Each part of a dead creature's body has different effects on the adventurer turned cannibal. Having a player who wants to eat bits of monsters is really uh, less uncommon than you might think. Some new magic blades, sewers of misery, along with some sewer geomorphs that you can use to quickly slap together a uh, sewer with tons of, look at all these D66 tables. What are you finding in the drains? What are you encountering? You can run a whole adventure right off of these couple of pages. A little exercise, complete the dungeon, complete the encounter. One of my favorite articles by Jack Shear, just use bears. So people talk about how hard it is to make your own monsters and how hard it is to stat them up and to create mechanics that work for them. Um, but in practice, what this points out is that if you just use the stat block for a bear, it works for like 90% of monsters and people won't really notice. And then just slap like a weird ability on top of that and you're basically good to go. Coming up with detailed stat blocks is really um, the least important part of monster making. It's about making something that engages your players and makes them uh, interact differently. We have a little collection of cool maps from different artists, different GMs all across the old school scene. This looks like a Skull Fungus's design. Oh, these are fabulous looking. The city over there. Uh, I believe this one is the fabled city of brass. So that is, who is it by? I'm blanking out for a second. That's Anthony Huso, uh, who's at the Blue Bard. He's kind of, uh, he does his own thing. He does, uh, he's very into AD&D and writing these very long detailed adventures that fully capitalize on, on AD&D's rules, which a lot of people in the OSR don't really use. So I think that's actually kind of interesting. I have one or two of his books, but I haven't read them yet. I believe he was also a developer on the Dishonored video game. We have a retinue of rogues, the living harness. So the stat blocks are usually very simple because it's OSR, but it's really about weird stuff that you add on top of that. The ne'er-do-well, the naked wanderer, a sheep, hamstero, swarm lords, Some former occupations that you might have, animated weapons, and we have Menagerie of Monstrosities, the Ambler, the Thurible Cat, the Mossling, it's a great art, Mole Folk, the Moon Siren, the Trode, Treasure Frog, and we Nox, um, Extraordinary Excursions, that's what it says, a little hard to read with that gothic font. So some quick little adventures here. The Citadel of Evil. You have some short little maps, all nicely keyed up for you to throw your players into. Praise the Fallen by Graphite Prime. This is a really well done map, or a, a way of designing an adventure. Just because you have all your different sections are color coded, 
and then you have arrows pointing directly at the map. That is how I uh, tend to like my maps because it's just very easy to reference. The wizard cave. And there we go, we are at the very end. Uh, I love the density of this book. Uh, I love how exuberant it is and how it just uh, showcases all of the weirdness and the joy and the wonder that has been bursting out of the old school scene over the last 10 years or so. So I was super excited to get this in my hands and I am really looking forward to seeing what issue two will hold. Um, it is accepting contributions at the moment. Like I said before, I'll put a link down below and also put links to where you can pick this up for yourself uh, if you would like to have it for yourself. All right, thanks for watching everybody. I'll see you guys next time.